You're listening to Feathers, a podcast of stories about God speaking and His people having just enough faith to believe Him and obey. I hope these stories inspire you and encourage you to take flight in your own faith. I'm your host, Amy Bennett, and this is Season 3, Episode 1. Well, hey, friends, and welcome to season three. Gosh, I am so excited to be back for another season. We had a month break for the holidays, and I just really hope that they went well for you. I am feeling so rested and re-energized and ready to jump into the year. Um, I've actually been working on some new things that are just for you. We have a new smartphone app that is in the approval process right now. So any day, you should be able to download that and easily access these episodes. Um, I'm also working on an online shop with products I've designed that are inspired from this podcast. So if you're following me on Instagram at Bennett AJ, you got a little sneak peek at that. I'm actually waiting on some coffee mugs to be printed right now. I have t-shirts coming. I've made bookmarks made out of some of the feathers I've collected over the last 18 months. This is all really fun things that I hope remind you of God's faithfulness and inspire you to say yes to the things that God is calling you to. I also am hoping to use some of these funds to sponsor some of these cool new things that we're doing, like the app. So it's a win-win for everyone, and I really just cannot wait for that to launch. But let's get down to business for today. Our first episode this season is with my friend, Mary Carver. I've known Mary through her blog, Giving Up on Perfect, for several years now. Um, She works from home for the site for everymom.com. Some of my writing has been on there. You might have seen that if you've been on Facebook. Um, Mary also writes for the Encourage website website and the day this episode launches her first book choose joy is releasing mary is just a blast to be around and i really enjoyed our time talking about her journey to publishing and the message of choosing joy so here's my conversation with mary carver well hey mary and welcome to feathers today hi there this has been a long time coming yeah it really has yeah i think you were one of the first people i asked when i started this podcast last year and you were like let's save it for my book so here we are Now you get to open us up on season three. So exciting. It's amazing. Yes. So how about you introduce yourself to everybody listening and talk about your family and what you do? Well, my husband and I have been married for 16 years and we have two daughters. Uh, One is eight and one is two. And we live in Kansas City. Um, I have been blogging for almost eight years which feels like an eternity in blog years. It is. (laughs) (laughs) Although not as long as you. You, I think, have blogged longer than anybody I know. Dinosaur. Oh, my goodness. 13 years. That's that's insane. I literally did not know what a blog was 13 years ago. Nobody nobody knew. (laughs) I had to explain the word blog to everybody that I met. That's awesome. I had to explain the word blog to somebody just last week. So, you know. Oh, okay. So that's okay. (laughs) Yeah, you know. Um. Yeah, so my husband and I have two daughters. We live in Kansas City. Um, I work part-time from home as a writer and also for the website foreverymom.com. And I've been working on this book for what also seems like forever, but has really been just about a year. Wow. I didn't realize it had been that amount of time. I thought it had gone on for a little while. So let's talk about your book a little bit. Um, And so today I think it's going to be a little bit different maybe than some of the interviews I've done because um, we're here to talk about your journey, Mm -hmm. writing the book and how that all came about, but also the message of the book, because I think that really ties in to faith and obedience and trust. So um, tell us a little bit about the book. Um, It it is even the book itself is a little bit different than some books that are out there. And then we can get into how you got um, involved in it. Sure. So basically what you're saying is that everything about me is a little bit weird. (laughs) (laughs) I think in a roundabout way. I'm I'm trying to say it nicely. (laughs) It's true. It's completely true. Well, my book is called Choose Joy, Finding Hope and Purpose When Life Hurts. And I am the co-author with another blogger, Sarah Frankel, who passed away a few years ago. And after she died, her family wanted to turn her blog writings into a book because she had inspired and encouraged so many people, and they wanted to continue that ministry. And so uh, they started working on it, but then realized they needed a writer to help them 
actually turn it into a book. And so I ended up getting connected with them. So it's a book about how to keep believing in God and, and that God is good no matter what life hands you. Sarah had a, um, an autoimmune disease and because of that and many, many complications that were a result of that, um, she lived in chronic pain that I, I can't even describe because I can't even imagine it. Uh, she ended up being homebound because she was, she was actually allergic to pretty much everything on the planet. It's almost uh, like the air, right? Like she couldn't even breathe she was, the air outside. Yeah, she couldn't, she couldn't even open her windows. Um, she, she was even allergic to the air inside her condo and had a special filter system for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I describe what she went through and what kind of life she lived, especially the last several years, I, I just think, how could anyone deal with that and be joyful? It's, it's a little ridiculous, yeah. really, but she did. She did. She had some kind of inner strength. Um, of a faith that, that I, I have seen very rarely that allowed her to lean on God in a way, um, that, so she was able to truly choose joy. I mean, that's not to say she wasn't in pain. That's not to say that she was some kind of Pollyanna with rose colored glasses. She was realistic about what her life looked like and where it was headed, but she praised God anyway. And so, and so the, she wrote, so she wrote through all of this, all through the pain she was able to write and um, had a lot of people reading and being encouraged through her blog, right? Yes. So she wrote about it and she wrote about a lot of different things. And you know, the thing is I struggle when I, when I describe Sarah to someone who didn't know her, because it sounds like I'm describing some saint or angel or someone who's just too good to be true. And that wasn't Sarah at all. She was funny and she was fun and she was real. And so it was the combination of those things that brought so many people to her blog and to her life. Um, because yeah, she was choosing joy through horrible circumstances, but she was also the the kind of girl that you just want to be friends with no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so I think it helps us, those of us who read her words, realize that she was just a person like me. And so when I face troubles, whether they're as extreme as hers or just regular run-of-the-mill junk that life gives me, maybe I can do that too. Mm-hmm. Um, I love her message. I've read the book, and I do want to get into um, some of that because I think there's some very specific things that uh, we can take from the book. Um, but I want to get into your story. Um, I know this is the story about this book is for you longer than a year that yes. this has kind of been a journey that you've been on for a long time. And I would love for you to like, you know, go back and, and hear about your struggles and kind of how you, how you got to this point. Sure. Well, I, like I said, I started blogging about eight years ago and, um, at the time I worked full time in public relations. And so I did lots of different types of writing And over the years, I started remembering that I kind of, sort of, maybe wanted to write a book. Oh, my God. I don't say that out loud. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, I I had this whisper of a, wait a minute, I think I've always kind of wanted to do this thing. And maybe I could. But I didn't. It's not like I jumped right in and started writing the great American novel. Um I wasn't quite sure what to do with that. And so as I went to blog conferences and got to be good friends with lots of different bloggers and saw many of them writing books, I started to take this idea, this whisper a little more seriously. Um, And then, okay, I have to think about the math. Well, I'm just going to say a few years ago, I went to the Illum conference and I went to um, a breakout session called, So You Want to Be Published?, And I sat with my roommate and we listened to these agents and editors talk about the process and what you needed to do and how many, what felt like billions of followers you needed to have before a publisher would take you seriously and took all the notes and everything. And so after the session was over, uh, my roommate and I both decided to go up and speak to one of the agents. And I don't even know why I wanted to talk to him. I, I guess 
my thinking was, this is the year I'm going to write a book proposal. So when I send it to this guy, I want him to remember my face so that he knows I'm a real person. So did you even know at this point, like what the, what the proposal was for, or you just kind (laughs) of had it in your mind that you thought maybe it would be the year? I, somewhere in between there. I mean, my blog is called giving up on perfect. And I felt like, I still feel like that is a message that so many women need and crave. Absolutely. Um, But I didn't know what, it's kind of a big topic. And so I didn't know which part of that would turn into a book. Um, But I thought I would figure it out. It was, it was just right. It was on my to-do list, right above right proposal. So figure out topic, right proposal. (laughs) That's important. (laughs) Yeah. And so I stood in line to talk to this agent. Um, My roommate Dawn did too. And I said, hi, Bill, my name is Mary. And I write a blog called Giving Up on Perfect. And I also write for Encourage. And he said, oh yeah, that sounds great. I said, yeah. And I, I want to write a book and, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to work on a proposal. And he said, great, great. Give me a call. That sounds great. And in my mind, when he said that, I just fell over on the floor and died right then. (laughs) I mean, he said, give me a call. What? Um, dream come true for a blogger, right? But then I turned into a crazy person and spent months and months not only procrastinating my goal of writing a book proposal, but not being unsure. Did he mean it? And if he meant it, did he really mean I have to call him on the phone? It's calling him on the phone. is kind of painful. And I still don't really know what to say. And I don't have a proposal ready. So does he want me to call him now? Or do I have to have a proposal? And can I just email him? Because that's way easier and a lot less scary. And I did this for months and months and months. It was stupid. But I did it. Meanwhile, my friend and roommate from the conference had had a similar conversation with him, took him up on his word, gave him a call, signed with an agent, wrote a proposal, had a book deal. Oh, my gosh. And so right when all of this was coming to a head for her, where she was getting her contract and getting ready to sign, I saw her at a retreat and I talked to her and I said, oh, my gosh, do you think it's too late for me? Did I miss my window? She's like, well, I have no idea. (laughs) But she gave me the name and number of her agent, Ruth, and um, said that she was sure I could take the easy way out and email her before having a proposal. So I did. And Ruth was very sweet and very, uh, very interested in talking with me and asked me for a book proposal. At first, she said just, you know, just a couple pages, just the basics, not a full proposal. But then she decided that she wanted a full book proposal, which, if you don't know, is like a 60-page thesis. <laughs> yeah, people uh, work on that like as hard as the book, I think. Yes, yes. And she wanted it quickly, like in a month. Oh my and so I went insane and wrote it and sent how, it to tell her. Tell me about timing. Like, is this, is this like last, the year before? Like, when is this? Okay, this is... A little over two years ago. Okay. So in October, I talked to her. The, so the previous, so a th- little over three years ago is when I went to that conference. The next summer, I talked to Dawn, and she said, just make the call. Or, you know, send the email. And mm-hmm. then that fall, I talked to Ruth, and she asked me for my proposal. I, I somehow managed to pull it together and sent it to her. And after what seemed like forever, but I think it was just a couple of weeks, she called me with her feedback in December. And at that point I was nine months pregnant. Oh my goodness. And she said, Oh, that's how I got it to get. That's how I put a proposal together in a short amount of time because I was nesting. See? Oh yeah. So, like I was Eating so, to create. Pro- oh my gosh. I was so productive. I mean, I don't miss being pregnant, but I'm. I was going to say, uh, I'm you miss get being pregnant productive. Again? Oh gosh, that would be nice. Not the pregnant part, just the productive part. <laughs> but not, well, you know what I mean. Not reproductive. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, back to the topic. Oh. <laughs> so she said about my first proposal, she said, it's pretty good, but it needs a lot of work. 
that's the bottom line. And, um, you know, it's interesting looking back, there were some things that so was I, this that like giving up settled. on perfect? Like this was like, ooh, and it, ugh. was this book related to your blog? I mean, yes, you it found was, a topic. The topic was giving up on the fairy tales that we write for our lives that we believe, even though we know it's silly. Like the, at the end of the day, we all kind of have fairy tales that we believe in. Um, like we expect our husbands to be Prince Charming, or we expect, you know, even if it's not a fairy tale like Cinderella. We all write stories filled with expectations for our mm-hmm. lives. And then when reality doesn't line up to that, what do we do? Mm-hmm. Okay. So this book was going to be about that. Um, but as it turns out, I mean, first of all, I, I, you know, I wasn't quite ready writing wise, but second of all, there were just some things in my heart that weren't quite um, where they should be. And, and even though I didn't realize it at the time, it came through in my writing. And that's what Ruth picked up on. And she's like, oh, this part just does not work. And so she said, you know, here are the good parts. Here are the things you need to work on. And But then she said, hey, I know you're going to have a baby soon. So don't stress. We'll come back to this when we can. When the time's right, it will happen. She's very encouraging. Uh, but still very honest about the work that needed to be done. So that was that. You know, I turned the calendar over, got ready to have a baby, wrote edit proposal on my to-do list again. And then I had a baby in January and um, was a little bit consumed with that as, you know, you do. Yeah. But then in April, April or May, I think it was April, uh, Ruth sent me an email and said, hey, I know you're real busy with a newborn, but if you have time, I have a, an idea I want to talk to you about. Well, of course. I'm like, newborn? What newborn? Yes, I will talk to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we talked, and she told me about Sarah's family wanting to put this book together and how they needed a writer to make it happen. And uh, she talked about how she thought it might be a good fit for me. And she had, Ruth had no idea that I knew Sarah. Uh-uh. No way. She didn't, she didn't know. She, I mean, she knew that we had both written for Encourage, but she had no idea that Sarah and I were friends and I had gone to Iowa to visit her, um, until, until that phone call. Oh my gosh. So of course, you know, I said, yes, I definitely want to talk more about this. Give me all the information. I get off the phone. I'm like laying on the floor crying, like sobbing because what just happened? Um, So because I don't remember the dates, when did Sarah pass? It was September of 2011. Okay. So it had already been a couple years. Yes. So when they started putting this together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And her sister, Laura, spent uh, the good part of those two years going back through Sarah's blog and pulling out all the best posts that she thought would make a good book. And so she did all that legwork before ever talking to an agent. Gotcha. So, yeah, so we just started talking, and um, I talked with Sarah's family a little bit, and then we put together, I put together a proposal. I don't remember exactly, I was still a little foggy in those newborn days, so I don't remember exactly the timing on that, but if I remember correctly, it was, again, it was another, like, oh gosh, now we have to hurry up and get this done in six weeks sort of thing, which is kind of how I work best, so that's all right. Um yeah, and then she shopped it to publishers, and we found one that was really excited about the project. And then it, the process took a lot longer than I um, anticipated as far as waiting for publishers to respond and then making all that official. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then I started writing, well, I started working on it in the fall of, 2014 and then turned it in early 2014 well Hmm. early March and now here we are it's being published which is really exciting yes it's a real thing to be on a real bookshelf (laughs) I know I I I get really excited when I go into bookstores and see um bloggers like on the bookshelves like oh my gosh they're like real books I know I know 
<laughs> it's so exciting. I, I, I'm so excited for you. Um, yeah. I just would love to ask, like, when you think about it, I mean, I know you've had different jobs along the way. Yeah. Um, what are some of you, just your thoughts about, you know, obedience and, and trust through all of this, just knowing that that was a desire of your heart and then seeing that that's really not where you were? Well, yes, I have had many, many jobs. Like those career specialists who say that you're supposed to keep your resume to one page have not had as many jobs as I have. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And the reason, well, I mean, there are lots of reasons, but the main reason I've had a lot of different jobs is that I've just always felt like there was something big that God had for me to do. And I don't mean big, like famous. I don't mean big, like world changing. Um, but big for me and big for him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's almost like specific. Like there was something very specific. Yes. That you were going towards. And I, I just, I don't know. I've just always felt this drive to figure out what it is he wants for me to do. Now I will say, um, I I see this all differently from this side of it. I I think part of that's age and experience and just perspective. Um, There's, there's a lot that I learned and needed to learn in all those jobs. So it Mm -hmm. wasn't like I was in those jobs until I could write a book. It was part of the process, right? It was part of the process. But I, I knew, I just, I always felt like, None of those stops along the way were the end, you know. Mm-hmm. And so were- do you feel like, so you travel this feeling, this internal kind of battle, this is not where I'm supposed to be. There's something else you're learning along the way. Mm-hmm. So now that you're here, do you feel like that kind of desire satisfied? Like this is it, the thing that you've been looking for? I feel like I'm content where I am with writing and speaking and feeling like I have kind of a ministry kind Mm -hmm. of starting. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I, I, the wisdom I have now that maybe I didn't have 10 years ago is that I feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be right now, but I have no idea how long that will be true. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like next month, God could, place another seed in my heart that says, okay, time to move on. Or, you know, this could be the only book I write, or I could write 10 books. You know, I could start getting calls to speak at bigger conferences, or even the tiniest mops group group might start canceling me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I, I'm able to hold that a little more, more loosely now. I think when I was early in my career and, and trying so hard to figure it all out, you know, that wonderful time in our twenties, I I held on to everything so tightly because I just felt this desperation. Like this could be it. This might be the thing I'm supposed to do. Well, I think it's, I mean, I think it's so valid because I have felt that too. Like there's something out there. Like I feel like God is like pulling me. It's like the light at the end of the tunnel (laughs) or Mm -hmm. something like you feel pulled towards that. And I think in a lot of ways, I mean, honestly, in this podcast and, um, other things going on, like, I feel like that's, I had the same kind of thing in in myself. Yeah. Um, it's like there was something else beyond just writing on a blog that mm-hmm. I was kept being pulled toward. And I think the whole speaking on a podcast and then just speaking to groups and just other things that are fun things that are happening. Like, I feel like those are almost like the birth of the things that were growing. And I feel like that's sort of how you felt as yes. well. And I think it's really important to just to tell people that are listening that that's valid and to keep looking and to keep asking God for what those are. And I, but it, Beyond that, I think it's really important in all of that to say that the things that have happened along the way have absolutely been preparation for the thing. Yes, yes, definitely. And also, I think, I don't know, I would just encourage people to I don't, to really hold on to your faith that there is something planned, that he does have a reason for all of this, because it would be it would have been really easy i think in my life to feel like to give up to feel like you know what i have tried x y and z a b and c 1 2 and 3 and none of it works i failed at all of it i give up 
Mm -hmm. And honestly, I did feel like that. And I have felt like that over and over again. But thankfully, I mean, I don't, I don't give myself any credit for it, but I was able to come back to this belief that God would use me and he would use me in a big way. And again, I don't mean big like Jen Hatmaker or Oprah Mm -hmm. or Bill Gates. I don't know. But he would use me in a way that, that mattered to him and to me. And the, there was a reason that all those other things didn't work on a long-term basis. And it wasn't that I'm a failure. It's that they weren't the right thing. Right. They were just stops along the way. They were. They weren't the end game. They weren't the big plan. They were just parts of a bigger plan. Mm-hmm. And so. I and I think this is so, um, I think this is a really good segue into some of the things that Sarah actually wrote about because, you know, you talk about feeling like there's a big thing and, and it being like a celebrity, you know, so I think we have so easily want to say, think our big thing is, you know, a million followers on Twitter or something, you know, like celebrity sort of status. Cause that's the right. American way. Right. Yeah. Um, Sarah has this quote on page 11 of her book. Um, and the, the kind of this, well, let's just talk about the book for a minute. It's actually divided into the chapters, um, kind of have topics of her different blog posts, and then all the blog posts within the chapters kind of tie together. Mm-hmm. Did I, is yes. that about right? That's yes. the way I felt like it was. And for me, very much just for people wondering, the book felt very devotional like. I felt like there was, I mean, I could read like a little bit and like really glean and then kind of stop and, and think about that and then move on maybe like the next day. It's not for me. It was not one of those where you sit down and you read it in a day. Right. And it's it's an, it, it's sort of like, it's almost like when you were reading her blog, like every day you just c- continually getting encouraged. Yes. Um, in her book, she says, the burdens are persistent. The pain is relentless. I walk with crutches and it takes me longer to get up out of a chair than it takes my friends to get up and walk the length of my condo and back. But I know that if God didn't have a purpose for my illness, he would have taken it away from me by now. So I take it humbly and pray that if he has a purpose for me, I am paying attention so I don't miss the opportunity to serve. I'm okay with not knowing why this is happening to me because I know he knows why. And so I think one of the things I took from the book is that, you know, we we talk about feeling like there's something God is calling us to do. And for Sarah, it was a very painful experience that he was allowing in her life. And she felt seemed to me felt very much that there was purpose even in that yes and even more to that she talks about um in in a chapter in a a section called on surrender and trust she says um so many people say as they are going through a hard time that someday they will look back and see how all the pieces fell together but i think a big part of trust is walking around walking ahead in faith and being okay with never knowing, never understanding. I think trust comes down to walking a path simply because he has asked us to. And I think that's really revolutionary because I think we hear God has plans for us. He works everything for our good. And so we Mm -hmm. think, yeah, I can travel this hard path because I'll understand it when I'm through it. And sometimes we don't ever know it. And, you know, I think we can look back on Sarah's life and see all the encouragement she's able to bring um, even now. Mm -hmm. And yet she was okay with not understanding. Yeah. It's, it's things like that, that when I was working on this book made me say out loud to my screen or the stack of paper, who says that? And really means it. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Yeah. Really means it and really lives it because I don't, well, I don't know how to do that yet. I really like being able to look back and see what God was doing and, and understanding why those hard things had to happen. So when I can't see it, either I can't see it yet, or maybe I never will see it. Um, it, I, I struggle honestly. Um, and so, yeah, to read her words and to really think that through, what does that look like in real life? It's a challenge. It's a challenge. I mean, yeah, because I think we can celebrate like, uh, you know, you looking back on your story and mm-hmm. say, oh, like, I see why I was in that job. I see why I yep. was in that job. But while you're in it to say, I may never know why I'm in this job and be joyful about it. <laughs> that's, that's different. That is very different. And sometimes, I mean, I think about, I mean, I think about my mother-in-law. She died after my husband and I had just been married a couple years. 
She was very young. She was only 49. A freak car accident. And so here we are um, 15 years later. And I feel like enough time has gone by that we should be able to look back and see why that happened. Yeah. And be able to see how God put all those pieces together and how it's been used for his glory and all that. And I don't see any of that. And so for me, that's a situation in my life that's really hard um, to continue processing and to to not get bitter about because it doesn't make any sense. And I really, really want things to make sense, except that's that's a really crazy or silly thing to ask from God because his ways are not our ways. Right. And I think that's, though, it's really important that we go back to the promises of God, Mm -hmm. that he tells us, you're not going to understand it, and it's okay. And he promises, I am working it for your good, and you don't have to worry about it. And I think that's where the rest comes in, is that we go back to his words in Scripture and go back to the truth and say, I don't understand this, but he does. Yes. Yes. And that's what Sarah said so many times. And I know she believed it. And 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 she also— Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, she also was honest about the tension between hope and faith and trust and obedience. So at the same time that she trusted that God had a plan, even if she never understood it, she also still remained hopeful that she could be healed or that things could change or that things could get better because because she knew, and I don't think we've said this, but she knew that this was a terminal diagnosis, right? Yes, yes. But, and but I, remaining I believe, hopeful. Yeah, I don't believe that the disease she has is always terminal, but because of the way her body handled it and all the complications that followed, I mean, for her, you know, toward the end, she could definitely see this is probably not going to get better. Mm-hmm. But she had, she had people say to her, well, if only you believed enough, you would be healed Mm -hmm. or things like that, which. (sighs) No, I mean, I think that's so. It makes me so angry to hear people say that. It's so false because if you think about it, I've been reading through the gospels over, I did it over Christmas break. And you look at people that were so faithful to Jesus, Stephen and Paul and John, and you look, I mean, they're beheaded. They're stoned to death. I mean, God does not promise good. No. Always in what we see no. as good. No. And so for her, you know, I think the way that she resolved that in her heart was that she understood that healing didn't necessarily mean physical healing. Mm-hmm. I mean, she talked about the ways that God had healed her heart and that he had changed her and used her, not despite her disease, but because of it. Yes. And I do want to talk about that because I think it's really important is that um, because she, the the chapter is called On Losing Abilities, and um, she was very, from what I can tell, I didn't know Sarah, but from what I can tell, she was very active before things got bad. Um, Tell me some of the things that she did. Oh my gosh, she was a Renaissance woman. She was an artist, she was a writer, she was a singer and a dancer, she was an actress. Um, I think that we probably would have been friends in high school. Not that we would have, she was a little bit older than me, so we wouldn't have been in high school at the same time, but, um, she was involved in everything and I, I kind of was as well. So I just had so many interests and she was just so, I mean, even after she was sick, she was so full of life, so vibrant. And I mean, it seems cliche to say that she was joyful, but she really was. She was a full person. She was not drab or bland or boring or beige in any way. And so she was active in all those things. She sang uh, at her church. She was very involved with her church, uh, very involved with uh, the church that she went to during college and like led retreats and did speaking. Um, she but then was, she got to she got to the point where she was homebound, like you talked about. She couldn't do any of those things. And then yes. from in this chapter, what she's wrestling through is losing a lot of those abilities and kind of questioning, like, God, you like you gave me those gifts. Like, right. why would you give them to me if I can't use them? And she says, I'm on page 22, um, I can't do any of those things anymore. Those things I used to be able to do because of genetics. Without my physical body working correctly, they became impossible. But it's the gifts of my spirit 
given to me by God that were there along with my body, and those gifts remain after the disease has made my body in many ways useless. And then she begins to talk about the heart behind a lot of her gifts and said, I still had the desire to think analytically and write my thoughts so I could learn how to deal with them. I still had the desire to be positive and find the good amidst the bad. I still had the desire to learn better ways of coping. And he provided me with patience and fortitude and understanding and compassion and empathy. This disease has taken away some talents that genetics gave me, but God never has. This disease has taken things from me, but it can't take away the spirit that God put inside of me, the core of who I am, as long as I choose to nurture that side of myself. And so I think it's just really important to talk about that God gives us gifts and there are times in our lives that he calls us to exercise those. Um, but that's going to change. But I feel like the heart, like what she's saying is the heart behind those mm-hmm. may not change. Yeah, that was so wise that she was able to see that because I know that, I mean, it's, completely different. But in my career, some of the frustrations I felt over the years um, were, were similar in that I felt like I had something to offer and nowhere to give it. Like I had this skill, God gave this to me or this, this passion or this, um, you know, this calling, but nobody wanted me to use it. I didn't have a place to use Mm -hmm. it. And so it's, it's obviously very different from her situation, but, but the heart of it's kind of the same. And, and so to hear her say to, I don't know, I think after I read it, it seems so obvious, but to say, you know, the true gift that God gave me is just manifested differently in different seasons. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And I feel like that too. I was just talking about my writing and this podcasting, like my desire, my heart is to encourage people. And for years it was writing and now it's podcasting. Like, yeah. Still encouraging people, just doing it a little bit differently. Yes. Um, and so Sarah didn't lose abilities, but did not lose the heart to love people. And that's what I heard over in the book is, is how well she loved people um, from where she was at. And really, it was a gift that she was able to um, love people from where she was and had time that maybe other people didn't. Yeah. And, um She says, and this is a chapter on serving a community, I know I'm not able to do grand things for great numbers of people, but I am going to consciously choose to stay focused on others, to be his hands and feet in the little ways that matter to people. Yeah, she was so good at loving people. I mean, you hear the, it's cliched now, but love is a verb. Well, she was such a great example of that because I know in so many of my interactions with her conversations or when I visited her at her house afterwards, I felt like, Oh dang it. I talked about myself the whole time, you know, like, <laughs> I would go, Oh, I meant to ask her this, or I never found out about this, you know? She, and she would, she would pull that out of me and, and seem to want to listen to me. And then later I'd feel so bad. But what's interesting is that as I talked with her friends and family, as I was working on the book, they all said the same thing. They all said, Sarah made me feel like the most important person when I was with her. They all said, Sarah wanted to hear about my life. She wanted to hear about every little thing that I was frustrated with, even though it seemed minor compared to her struggles and her challenges. You know, Sarah wanted to hear all the great things that were going on in my life, even though she would never experience them for herself. I mean, she just poured into people and it, it doesn't even seem adequate to say she gave everything she had because I feel like she gave more than that. Mm. I mean, the, the math doesn't add up to think about the energy and, and the heart that she gave to so many people. And I, mean, I was just a blog friend, but she made me feel like that just like she did her lifelong friends or her college friends or her sister or her mom or whoever she was with. I think, I think, I included it in the book that she just said, whenever I'm with someone, I'm with them. Mm -hmm. And I have thought about that Mm -hmm. since reading this book, I'll be with somebody and I'll be looking at my phone or something and I'm, you know, I'll just put it down. Like, no, like I need to be with people and that's a gift. And that's really, that's obedience because our call from Jesus is to love people. I mean, the greatest command of all love God and love others and to give the people honor and, and time, and all of that is is part of loving people. And, you know, we, sometimes we do make these grand things about next step God's had for us. And I, and I do think that's so valid. But I think 
it's so important to remember that these little moments are also steps of obedience as well. And all of that leads to a great joy, which is yes. what she taught, you know, what this is, what this talks about. And um, I think there's a, um, at the end of your end of the book, it talks about some of the um, things that her friends and family had written about yes. her. And I wanted to share, and I thought they were great, um, Elise that shared at the memorial service. Mm-hmm. And I think she just kind of wraps up this idea um, really well. It says, choosing joy is acknowledging that while I don't understand what's going on, God does. Choosing joy is remembering that while life seems to be spiraling out of control, it is never out of God's control. Choosing joy is remaining mindful that while my circumstances may feel anything but ideal, God still has my good and his glory in mind. Because like Sarah said, it's not about me. It's about what he can do with my life. And so I think that choosing joy really at the root of it is about, you know, just what she said. It, it, it's really focusing and fixing our eyes on Jesus and what he has for us. And because of that being content mm-hmm. and then the fruit of all of that is the joy. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing all that. I've, I'm just, I personally, I knew a little bit about Sarah just through the Encourage folks and you guys, um, but had never read a lot of her words, a couple posts um, at the end. So just thank you for taking the time um, to write it and to talk to me today. And um, if people want to connect with you on your blog or find the book, where can they do that? My blog is givinguponperfect.com. And for information about the book as well as links to all the places you can buy it uh, you can go to the choosejoybook.com and you can find everything that you could possibly want to know there um, it's on amazon barnes noble it should be at your neighborhood bookstore oh it's so exciting yes i gotta go i will send you a picture i'm gonna go find it at a bookstore oh fun that'll be fun all right well thanks a lot mary thank you you. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Mary. One thing I really take from Mary's story is just even if God has planted some sort of seed or dream in your heart that we can feel growing, that the stops along the way are not to be ignored or hated or even complained about. I mean, when we're really truly following him, those stops along the way are absolutely part of the plan, part of the preparation process. So at the moment, they are the thing that we're supposed to be doing. It reminds me of the verse from Zechariah that says, Do not despise small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. So I would pray that we can all, no matter at what point of our journey that we're in, just rejoice in where we are because God is at work. And there's so much to take from Sarah's story in her book. I really do hope that you pick up that book, Choose Joy. There's so much to learn um, from someone who has walked in the shoes of Sarah. Um, I think one of the things that I really take away is just similar to what um, Mary, what we learned from Mary's story, is just being content in where we are, um, not looking back at what we might have had, letting go of that, um, not looking outside of ourselves to what someone else might have. You know, we all are taking different journeys and um, definitely Sarah had to be content in where she was, Um, but not even looking forward to where God might take us, but really just being content and flourishing and using the place that God has given us in the moment. That is really the place where we can truly choose joy. And I'm so thankful for Sarah and to be able to learn that from her life. So I hope you guys enjoyed today. I hope you're following me on Facebook at Amy J. Bennett Page, on Instagram, Bennett AJ, and then sign up for emails at featherspodcast.com. As the app is coming out and the online shop is launching, I want to make sure you guys are some of the first to know. So thank you, thank you, thank you for listening today, and we will see you next time on Feathers. (music) 